Alrighty, hello everyone. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hello, my name is John Hammond, which I'm sure you might already know, considering, hey, the YouTube channel that you're watching. But this is a special video. This is something new and this is something different because I am joined by my friend here, Christine. Hi. I am kind of approaching this as a cybersecurity guy, a cybersecurity person. And Christine is kind of joining this conversation as a recruiter as a talent acquisition specialist and as someone that's in the industry and hopefully we can have a very cool conversation ask each other a couple questions so we can break down the there's there's a lot of stuff to it right there's a lot of stuff to unpack between how does cybersecurity and our industry see talent acquisition and recruiters and how does that look on the other side how does talent acquisition kind of deal with us as people that could be hires or employees employers etc back and forth um disclaimer before we kind of dive into it we don't represent our current employer our company we aren't trying to speak on behalf of anyone these are just two people having a conversation together so we can all be yes. a little bit smarter on this and help out the community. Hopefully you can get some gold nuggets out of this. But uh, we've been trying to do this for forever, by the way. We've been planning <laughs> this for months. <laughs> we have. Yeah, every single time we've tried to record something, it either something would go wrong, one meeting would come up, maybe there was a babysitter that wasn't there, whatever the case might have yes. been. I just, we couldn't get around to it. So I am very, very excited to do this. Christine, I hope you are too. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for doing this. Cool. What do you? Should we just kind of dive into it? I can kind of kick off some questions. Go for it. Cool. So I'm hoping we can do some back and forth, informal, casual, just in getting to know each other and hopefully talking about good stuff that will be helpful for others, my community, your community, et cetera. My first thing okay. to kind of get us started is why are you passionate about what you do, about talent acquisition, about recruiting. What do you love about this stuff? Uh, well, that's an easy one for me. So recruiting really is, um, for me, it's, it's a big puzzle. So I like solving puzzles and people are, every single one is a different puzzle. And so particularly with this, you're looking at who is the right person for the job um, that's available and interested at, the same, at that time. And also how could they potentially impact an organization? Um, so really, it's just fitting those puzzle pieces together and finding the people is is a big challenge. Um, finding the right people is a big challenge. So it's fun. I like that, solving that problem. Cool. That's very cool. What about you? Yeah. Why, why are you in the field you're in? Mm, okay. So I, I really like computers, for one thing. That's probably pretty obvious. All kind of nerdy, geeky things. Um, <laughs> and I, I wanted to get into programming because every 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 kid, you know, they're growing up, they'd be like, oh, I want to make a video game. I want to hack computers. Yes. Um, so I started to tinker with that, to explore that. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was just enjoyable. Uh, when it turned into more of the cybersecurity, I don't know, good and bad, not just, not just make stuff, but break stuff, I just fell in love with how I don't know how interesting it was and how curious it was. I feel like I like to understand things and know how things work. I'm very questionable. I, I, well, I am not questionable. I like to question. <laughs> uh, I'm just inquisitive. And I think that's been a really, really fun thing about cybersecurity is that there's always something to learn and grow. And I'm, I'm always asking questions. Yeah. yeah, I assume we have some similarities where each of your days are, are never exactly the same. And that's big for, for us as well. I mean, recruiting, although most people don't think that way, but recruiting has a, a really broad um, spectrum of what you can specialize in. And there's a lot to actually um, try on different areas. So yeah, cool. Cool. Awesome. All right. So you were nice enough to go out there and kind of pose your audience um, and ask them what questions they had um, around talent acquisition. And you had some really, really good questions and you have a fantastic audience, a really, really engaged audience. So they posed some really, really interesting questions. Do you want to kick off with any of those to start off with? Yeah, uh, we, we certainly can. Uh, let me provide a little bit more background and context on that, right? Because okay. you and I have been planning to have this conversation for some time um, and I put it out on LinkedIn, I blasted it on Twitter, I just screamed about it on social media and the response was, 
overwhelming. <laughs> we have <laughs> almost 250 responses. How many questions right. that you want to tackle or I could tackle for both of us to address. And for one yeah. thing, I don't think we can answer all of them properly. Uh, and oh, obviously, do uh, you want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and obviously, yeah. I think a lot of them are very, very niche and specific. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that's really hard to address. Um, right. It's interesting because there's no one size fits all answer, but there are also mm -hmm. a lot of broad strokes that we can we can kind of safely say. Um, what do you think about that? I, I definitely think so. I think um, some of the questions that popped up, um, particularly around um, certifications, degrees. Um, let's let's talk about that. You know, do I have to have a certification? Do I have to have a degree? Do I have to have a specific degree to apply for a job? There are a lot around those. And I think those that you really need to look at is not just that specific item, but also look at the companies you're looking to work for. Um, is this typical with their jobs? Um, do they all require a degree? Um, do they all require a certain certification? Then maybe you want to go down that path. Um, but there are some very specific ones that were there were asked that I don't think we can answer, but it's more of a broad topic um, when it comes to degrees, um, experience, and um, and so it's because it really depends on that company and what they're looking for, um, and is that company a match for you? So that's one of the ones I wanted to talk about immediately because I think that gets asked a lot. Um, do I need X, Y, and Z for a job? Well, I mean, it depends. Depends on that job and that company, what they're looking for. So um, that one is important. What about you? Yeah, you I, I pulled it up ones? on the screen. I, I, I realize, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can, you probably can't see it. You're just still staring at me, but I tried to bring it up. So <laughs> the video that we're capturing, uh, we can see what some people might have asked. One one yeah. that's kind of interesting it's asking, hey, are there any, obviously everything echoes what you had said. It's very specific. What about certifications? What about a degree? What about training? And that varies from position to role to company, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that someone asks is, hey, are there any entry level positions even available? Or is that just some myth? <laughs> everything that <laughs> everything that I seem to see is asking about, oh, I need five to 10 years of experience, or I already need to be some seasoned veteran on this on this whole concept okay so there there absolutely are entry level positions however um each company is different in, in the way they view entry level positions and let's let's take it a step back so when we look at job descriptions on the whole um recruiters know it let's let's say it. job descriptions suck on the most part for the most part um you know their, who whose responsibility is it to write the job um, and the recruiter's typically the one that's posting it, but who's responsible for the data that's in there and making sure it's accurate and it's what's really needed for the job. So when you look at that, um, you may see things out there that really tell you that this job is not junior. You know, when you see a job out there that's three years of experience and then they're calling for a CISSP, well, obviously that's not junior, right? We know that. Um, that doesn't mean that that recruiter knows that, but it got lost somewhere in translation. So there, there is that issue um, with job descriptions. What I would say from there though, is that you need to look at a few things. One is, is just applying for the job the best way to get into an organization? Um, and the answer to that is gonna be no. Um, we know that referrals, um, whether it's someone you really know or someone through a network, that you know is the best way, a social referral is the best way to get into a company. So I would look, I would go that route and I would connect with people with that organization um, and find out really what's what's needed. Cool, cool. Do you think there are any other kind of specific ones we should dive into on, on that? Or a lot of these are asking, hey, uh, what about different countries? What about even a different continent? And unfortunately, I can't particularly speak to that. No, I can't either on that one. Um, that one's difficult. There was one around um, knowing multiple languages. I think that's definitely a benefit to an individual if they know multiple languages. Um, but I haven't seen a ton of requirements that require that, but that's just my experience. 
Um, there was one around what would be your ideal candidate. Oh yeah. And I thought, I thought this was interesting because this is kind of a broader question. And, and I think there's several ways to look at this. One is, you know, one is take a look and, and, and Google yourself, look at what you're putting out there as publicly available information. So what does your image say? Um, literally the picture you have, um, what, um, what things are you following publicly online? Um, what does your LinkedIn profile say? There are several people that I've connected with that actually their profile talks completely about a different type of role, but they really want to be in cybersecurity. Well, if that's the case, you really need to move your profile to showing up as a cybersecurity profile, even if you're looking for an entry level role. Um, so the ideal candidate is one that for me answers the questions um, to make my job easier. And what is that? My job as a recruiter is to fill jobs. Um, there are a lot of us that are really nice and will help help you help people out and, and to try to provide additional information on whether it's your resume or resume building or networking or kind of like what we're doing here. Um, but at the same time, my main job is to fill my jobs. So, uh, you know, I'm not the best for career guidance. You know, if you want to start there, there are plenty of people out there, Katia Dean or going to, you know, cyberseek.org, one of those places and, and getting additional information. There's tons of people you should network with. Obviously, John, you're one of them. Um, but you know, that's really important, but having a profile that answers those questions for me. So if I have a job and it says, you need X, Y, and Z skills or X, Y, and Z experience. Do you have that? Um, and then also the flip side of that is if I go to that profile on LinkedIn, you know, are you talking about things that, you know, in my organization, uh, we don't want to cover those things, you know, um, maybe, I don't know, let's, let's give an example of things that we wouldn't necessarily see. Like I, I necessarily don't want to know about a person, right? Um, so if, if, if it's publicly available, make sure it is what you want to present to an employer, I guess. Um, so a person that answers those questions, um, and is easy to contact and easy to follow up with. So, yeah. Okay. Th those would be the big ones. Cool. This, this is cool. Cause now my mind is starting to go into different places of things that I, I, there's a lot to unpack, right? Cause mm -hmm. when, when I think about us, I guess my, my world, the culture, the community, the scene in infosec yeah. or cybersecurity or some of that. And I'm obviously not trying to speak for anyone or making any, yeah. or I don't mean to be making any big assumptions, but I think there are two different kinds of people. Some that will be very, very open and very, very willing to talk about themselves or, or, or discuss and showcase and present the stuff that they do out online. Like, I think I'm a, a right. stupid fine example of that. Cool. You can see me screaming on Twitter. <laughs> you can see me everywhere on LinkedIn, obviously the YouTube thing. Right. Um, on that same coin, there are some mm -hmm. people that really, really want to keep that anonymity and want to remain private Absolutely. and will work with an alias just because they don't want to be out on the internet. It, right. from, from what you're telling me, it sounds like, well, that, that doesn't really help if you're job hunting, right? Right. Right. I mean, you know, look at, look at what recruiters do. They're going to do, you know, if you're doing a pen test, do you do the most difficult rabbit hole chase first, or do you do the easiest thing first? The easiest thing to do is to check LinkedIn, right? So we start there first and do we find the nuggets to solve our problem there? Um, you know, cybersecurity on a whole is, is, harder in that regard, just like you just talked about. There are plenty of people that don't have a profile online anywhere. Um, but if you want to be found, then you have to be found. And it's okay to make that judgment either way. There are ways you can work around that. Um, but, you know, in that case, that's if you're somebody who says, hey, I don't want to be online, um, that's where I would connect through, you know, the different B-sides organizations, the different meetup groups, any of those groups that you can connect with people and let them know that you're looking for a job. Um, okay. So you don't have a long, long profile, but you're connecting there and making those connections and hoping that, you know, that person can lead you to the right position or your next job. Um, so that networking piece is going to be big there with those groups. Cool. That's very cool. I like that. The, it's like, I always tout kind of the same thing. Hey, go to, go to, go to B-sides, go to the conferences, yeah. go to events. And it, it, 
I remember you told me, hey, you were going to something, I don't know, it was B-Sides Tampa or where, where it was, but you were hosting a resume review workshop. Yes. Um, yes. So one of the humongous questions we see all the time is, <laughs> okay, on our resume, what is the most important thing? Do, do they care about the degree? Do they care about experience? Right. Do they care about certification? And I, I, if I'm echoing kind of as what you spoke to earlier, forgive me, but I know all the time they ask, hey, I don't have this certification. Can I still get a job? I don't have a bachelor's. Can I still get a job? Right. Uh, anything on that or? Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to depend on the company. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, each, you know, with, with the directive that came out recently from the government in regards to um, moving away from um, requiring degrees for all positions, I think you will slowly over time see that start to transition um, you know, particularly we know around government contracting, you've got to have those basic qualifications. Um, and I think you will start to see that change over time. And that's fantastic because there are plenty of people that, um, you know, a traditional education didn't work for them. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not a valuable employee and, and don't make an impact in an organization. So um, when I look at a resume, I take it another step back. I look at immediately where is my eye drawn? You know, is there too much information? Do we have 15 different fonts? You know, is there any white space on this resume? One of my friends, um, Mike Coney talks about, you know, your eye looks for the white space. So if your resume is covered in so much text, it's like, where do I even look? Where do I start? Um, so your contact information is so important. Have that up front. Um, you know, do you have a LinkedIn profile? Great, add it there. Are you active on GitHub? Great, put it there. If you're not, okay, that's fine too. Um, and then from there, your resume really needs to speak to the job that you're um, going for. So the job you're applying for or going for. So, you know, when you look at this, you're going back to what is the story I'm trying to tell an employer? Does this resume, and it's very hard to look at your resume objectively, right? I mean, even for me, this is like, I have to have somebody else look at it. Um, and, and you may find you're going to have to go through several revisions, you know, do a Google search on cybersecurity resumes or, you know, SOC analyst resumes and see what's out there online as a Google image and look at them and see which ones that your eye is drawn to and in which you're like, oh, like that's way too much. I, I think it gives you a visual and then also how they're focusing their careers. Also look in the organizations that you're looking to work for. Hey, do those people in that company list some of the information? Do any of them have them as attachments on their LinkedIn profiles? So you know that they've gotten a job already. So what does that look like? Um, so you've got your contact information up front. Um, is the degree and the cert a requirement of the job? So if it is, and then you want to list that in there, the first three quarters of the first page of your resume is the most important. So every, and I know people don't want to do this because it, it, I get the question all the time. You know, do I have to rewrite my resume for every single job? No, you don't have to rewrite your resume, but you may have to move things around on it. So one, you need to know the impact that you've had. Maybe it's a school project. Maybe it's, you know, you're doing Hack the Box and this is what I've done here. You need to know what your impact is in each of those positions and then how it relates to the potential job that you're looking for. So, hey, you know, they're going to require X skill. You know, it's one of the top requirements on the job you need to say the related information of how you relate to that job. And when you look at, hey, if I've got 10 bullet points, if you're going at John's old resume versus his new resume, which is the paragraph format, but if you're going bullets, you wanna make sure that those are in order of um, what matches the job skills. So that, again, you're making a recruiter's job easier, an HR, an admin, whoever it is, that's looking and saying, yep, this person has X, Y, and Z for this job. Because trust me, uh, despite what people think, we actually want to fill those jobs and not have to look at 50 more resumes. Um, not that there are 50 cybersecurity professionals applying to all of our jobs. <laughs> that would be a giant myth, but um, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, you know, you want to answer those questions up front for them. That just means moving a bullet around, but what, you know, or a sentence around. So what are you saying in those sentences? This is important. You need to speak to the impact that you've made versus just the skill you had there. Um, I find a lot of the times where I have kids and I say, hey, they'll, they'll blurt out a statement to me. I'm like, okay, complete the sentence. What are you actually telling me? This is what you need to do there. You need to give a full complete picture of what you're talking about. 
Now, I'm not saying you need to have a 10 page resume. Um, by the way, I don't go by the standard, the standard of having a one page resume, don't follow it. Two pages is fine. If you have more experience, longer is fine as well. But the first three quarters of the first page is really a, is key to speaking to the job. Cool. So it was a really long winded answer for answering the question. No, I mean, you threw in a really good one because people are always going to ask like, how long should my resume be? And it, it, I know it's like a, a silly and annoying question to probably hear or ask, but yeah. one page isn't, I don't think enough. Three, you kind of sometimes, I don't know if you could ride the line of just looking like a jerk or uh, I don't know. Two, two is, is perfect. You're saying? Yeah. Two is fine. I mean, look, whenever I know when I get a PhD resume, because typically they are a lot longer. Um, it just depends on the person, their years of experience. Um, you know, if you look at a federal resume, a federal resume wants every bit of detail for you to not leave anything out in your experience. Um, you know, when you're looking at a, at a tech company, they're probably going to want a shorter resume. Um, but you want to make sure that you're not leaving out things that are required in the positions that you're looking for. Cool. So yeah, that's key. You, yeah, uh, so. you, sorry, you mentioned hack the box though. And that, that kind of yeah. raised my eyebrows because uh, do, do you think stuff like, obviously a lot of us like to train, like we like to play, we, we go through yeah. all those exercises and those war games. Is it worthwhile putting in like, Oh, my rank on hack the box is this, my try hack me thing is this, or does that useful? Do some people even know what that is or care? Yes. It depends on the level of the recruiter. Okay. But, um, so you're doing two things with that. One is you're showing that outside of my job, I'm interested in what I do. So that's, that's one piece of it. Another thing is that you're providing additional, um, keyword and Boolean capability when you add additional words to your resume. So if I go and look at, you know, I'm going to do a search for people who are doing that. Um, obviously it depends on the type of recruiter you are right and the company that you're working for, but I'm going to dig deeper for those tools, uh, tools, those, um, different keywords and, and put those in my searches. So if you have them, you're going to pop up in my search. Cool. Yeah. It's important. Okay. So I, if I'm asking you too many questions, forgive me. I mean, we can totally, <laughs> we can totally change the, change the game in a, in a moment, but I, I do want to ask, cause now that you mentioned, yeah. Oh, the search, right? This ominous kind mm -hmm. of thing that, that you, you need, uh, please, please help kind of fill me in. Cause I don't know what that recruiter or talent acquisition process like looks like. And, and obviously yeah. there are some people that might ask like, Oh, are, are all the recruiters super selfish because they don't care if, if you get the job or not They're They need to do it for their own quota. How does that work? If I may, <laughs> hey, you know, that's another one I I'm, not going to answer well because it totally <laughs> depends on the organization. Um, Can so I interrupt you before we jump yeah. in real quick? I see a timer yeah. notification on Zoom that says, hey, this will end in 10 minutes. Upgrade now to remove the time limit. Um, can I tell you when we're getting close to that cutoff time and then we can just rejoin if you want to keep talking? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that works. Cool. Cool. Um, totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> How does the talent cool. acquisition and recruiting yes. process work? What are the deep, yes. dark, squirrely secrets? Um, so uh, first of all, baseline. So there is no degree in talent acquisition. So each person's skill and, and um, training is going to be very different. Um, like you, I'm really interested in, in my field of choice. So I spend a lot of my free time reading about it, attending conferences, um, working online with other people to better, um, who I am as a recruiter. So that is just a base of information. So you're not going to get a standard of, of service and or skill, um, which is a challenge for us. And we know that, um, secondly, there are different types of recruiters that are going to reach out to you. Um, and it's okay to have a conversation with them. And what I mean is, you know, so for instance, myself, I love what's called sourcing for us. So I love the search for someone. Um, I like the um, pulling publicly available information. I like doing that deep dive and looking for someone. Um, not everybody does that. Um, there are recruiters that are compensated based on a person being hired and there are people that are not. It just depends on the organization and their you know kind of compensation structure for those recruiters. Um, so the, the actual process of finding somebody can be very different as well. Some recruiters are, you know, really like LinkedIn and job boards. 
Um, and some recruiters, you know, really are big on the different social media platforms. Um, you know, and then some recruiters like doing just x-ray searches. I mean, it just depends. Um, and of course there's, there's tools on the market as well together to get, um, additional information from people. So whether it's, you know, getting just their contact information. So if you look at kind of the OSINT level, that's, um, not the technical side of it, but yeah. more of just finding information. Yeah. So, yeah. That's still very cool to me. I guess I just never <laughs> thought of it, you know, like I, I never think about my work is cool. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. You never, I never think about other, oh, the real databases that people use to, to find you to help, honestly. Like yeah. If you're, if you're... Well, I mean, yeah, you have to look at like the, the history of recruiting, right? They, the market used to be in our favor. Um, now with the internet, you have to be fast and, and smart about what you're doing. And particularly with, you know, a group of individuals that may or may not be online. Um, and, and are also getting contacted left and right by different organizations, um, and for positions that may or may not be right for that person. So we won't go there, but, um, <laughs> you know, no, that's a challenge. Um, but we know that, 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 um, how quickly we get to you and how effective we are in our messaging is, is very important. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so on that note, um, let's talk about getting in contact with, and we're group, we're lumping you into everybody into cybersecurity, by the way. So um, we know you don't specialize in everything, but um, you are easy to find, right? So you're one of those golden nuggets, those, um, we used to call them purple squirrels, now they're unicorns. So you're one of those people that is easy to find online. How... Um, you know, and recruiters love to find different ways to contact people. So whether it's, you know, text or email, that's not original, but um, phone calls, which do you prefer? And do you hear others talk about that? Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, um, and I guess I have my own repertoire of, of, of work experience or places I've been, um, and it's just how I like to be reached out to. Uh, I prefer a classic email, in all honesty, uh, just just because it also gives a little bit more control to me. And they're like, I'll respond to you when I have time to respond to you. <laughs> uh, and, yes. And if or if I even want to, I could be a jerk and just totally ghost you, which I'm sure is right. another another can of worms we could, we could get into. Yes. Um, the the phone calls I I don't like as much unless we have planned that or already coordinated like, hey, I can chat with you at this specific time. Um, and a lot of that probably comes from me in, in past work experience. I, like obviously I had worked in like a skiff or, or a secret okay. space where I don't have the availability. I literally cannot answer your phone call <laughs> unless you tell me <laughs> to go leave. Uh, and that's just part of it. Texting, right. texting, honestly, I've never actually had a conversation with like with a recruiter in, in that realm. I, I think that would be very cool personally, just because I think that adds mm -hmm. a little like personal touch and it makes me feel like, hey, we're bros, we're buds, we're, uh, I would like that, but it would, mm -hmm. I guess it would kind of depend on the approach. If like, hey, are, are they being friendly? Are they willing to, are they, am I, are they visibly on my side to help me and kind of help me right. grow? So the flat, stupid, easy answer in my case is I, I just prefer emails or a silly LinkedIn message. But I mean, as you, as you might say, well, then I could very easily not respond. And that probably doesn't help right. you on the recruiter side. Right. Right. Well, what about the, well, thinking in terms of, so say that you do do open an email. Are there things that immediately when you look at an email are going to turn you off or are going to potentially turn you on to actually reading it? Yeah. Okay. I, truth be told, right, transparency, uh, I am a, a greedy guy. <laughs> like, first thing I'm going to look at is the salary. Like, absolutely, the first thing I'm going for is the number, is the compensation. Mm -hmm. Because, sure, we're talking about cybersecurity. We're talking about red teaming, pen testing, adversary right. emulation, blue team, sock, CISO, I don't know. Uh, all mm -hmm. that stuff is typically a well-funded industry. <laughs> right. uh, so if it's, if the number is not either where I'm at 
or close to it and they're giving me other benefits. Okay, remote work is something that I personally care about. That might differ for some people. Um, but And obviously in the different situation, maybe someone has a family that they want to be either close to or they need they care more about benefits than specific day-to-day compensation, etc. cetera. Um, that, is, that is my immediate eye grab is the, is the salary and the number. So I need them yeah. to tell me. If that is not included, I will either ignore you or wait a very, very long time and then be like, oh, hey, actually, what was the salary on that? (laughs) And I'll be direct. I'll be like straight up like, I'm not going to give you the time of day unless you can be honest and tell me what it is. Um, Truth be told, that's my transparent answer anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at that, um, there are a lot of organizations that don't allow recruiters to put that information in an email. So what would you suggest for a recruiter in that case that literally can't put the resume in or the resume, your, your, the compensation in a yeah. actual email? Interesting. I don't, I didn't know that was like a limitation. I mean, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. But yeah. are they, are they capable to kind of put a range or can they safely say like, Hey, North of six figures or like South of six figures even, or can they put a window? Is that kosher? It depends on the organization, right? right? So it depends on how you're allowed to phrase it. Um, Some organizations want to make sure that you're interviewed before they talk about that compensation piece or confirm a range for you. Um, You know, if there's other contingencies to that position, they may want to clear those first before they can give you compensation. A lot of times what it will look like is they will ask for your desired compensation, what's important to you, and that that um, process and that, you know, if you, if you were to get an offer, what amount would you be looking for? And then they can kind of tell you, yes, you're in the range or no, you're way outside of it. Um, that is, is typically what you're going to see. And I think that's a challenge because, um, I think there's a, a miscommunication there. And I think what happens is a lot of times that people think that if we don't offer someone the highest salary, like we're reaping some reward from it, I've kind of heard words around that and, you know, typically that's not going to be the case. Um, we want you to fit the job so that we have less of a job finding the next person, you know, or the ne- you know, to yeah. fill that role. Um, I don't want so, to, I don't yeah. want to cut you off immediately, but I'm We're seeing there. zoom. Yeah. Zoom. Tell me, Oh, it's, it's about go time. So I will restart this conversation if that's totally okay. cool with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Stand okay, by. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Sorry about kind of that flop there. We're doing this through Zoom. No We've been trying to figure out, hey, what what actual conversation platform can we can we get this right on? So Zoom yes. looks good, but it's also hurting us on time. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Taking a little longer too. So yeah, it's good. Cool. All right. So what were we talking about? Uh, I was. You were asking me a little bit about salary, and you were telling me like, hey, that's not yes. always something that recruiters can discuss or have that conversation yeah. with. Yeah, we can't disclose it, okay. right? Okay. Right. So not until you, a lot of organizations won't let you, um, the recruiter give that information until you've been maybe technically assessed um, and kind of proven that you are serious about that process. So you're gonna go through filling out an application or maybe you've gone through an interview, a manager, or, um, a technical interview or something like that. That's an example. That's not required for all, but be aware that there are maybe organizations where they can't tell you what the compensation is. So yeah, absolutely. Oh. Have you um, have you come across that at all? I think so. I mean, so I, I have been in through a few phases or transition points where like, hey, I'm looking for a new gig. Um, I'm kind of, I don't know, away from what I am doing currently because I'd like to do, just do something else. Um, right. And there's something that looks interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll wade through a couple or whatever I see, whatever props up that seems to be like, this looks like the coolest fit. This looks like the best number. This looks like the most comfortable working circumstance and situation. Um, right. And then I will ask just the others if there are in that situation, can you compete with this? <laughs> not, not directly, right? I'm not going to obviously tell them, oh, I have this other offer. Uh, what can you do better? Is that a tactic, right. by the way? Before I forget, is that something that works or is just kind of a jerk move? I mean, if you, if you really have another offer, um, I think being honest with your recruiter Um, despite what Google says when you do a search for recruiters are what they say, um, we actually are humans and, and want to do our job. So, 
you know, if you have other offers on the table and you are looking at them, yes, we want to know that so that we can make sure that not only we're meeting your demands, but also we don't want to waste our time internally if you're really seeking other opportunities. And, and that's not to say don't do that. You should look around and see what is the best fit for you. Um, because if you, as we know, if you choose the wrong thing six months down the road or a year, you know, you're going to move on. So you should look at other opportunities. Um, but yeah, be, be honest with the recruiter about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would just ask directly if they hadn't provided about, I would ask about the salary, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of talk in the, uh, talent acquisition community about AI. We oh. know it's not AI. We know it's not, we know it's not, but you know, it's one of those, those terms right now. That's the it phrase. So technically machine learning, I'm not saying it's AI. We'll start with that, but um, there are a lot of tools out there that um, will gather additional information on a person. I'm not saying illegal, but will provide us um, additional information on who you are, right? Um, and and we can see groups that you're in, um, different pictures, things like that, information that's available online. Um, how do you feel about an organization, you know, having this profile on you um, when they reach out to you? Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my opinion might, I guess, be different from others. Again, the disclaimer that I, that I have to put, right. Just as kind of yeah, who absolutely. I am and others. Um, personally, I put out stuff into the world, uh, and the internet and the socials because I like it and I'm proud of it. Um, if obviously there were some silly kids that were putting out information, sharing photos and things about not good things uh, that would, that, like you've discussed before, hey, we just genuinely don't want to see. That's not cool. Uh, yeah, that that would be a bad thing. Um, if, if a company has a database or if they are finding this information about me, uh, in my case, I am, I like that. But that's just me. That, yeah. might, that might not be the same thing for everyone. But again, I take the stance like I'm going to put stuff out there that I like and I'm proud of. And I think that this is cool and I want other people to see it. Otherwise, I wouldn't do mm -hmm. it. Um, right. So one of the coolest things for me is when a recruiter or when a talent acquisition specialist or an individual kind of says like, dude, I saw your talk the other day at, at GrimCon. That was really cool. I like that you did that. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. Thanks, man. <laughs> right. Like I, right. I'm keeping up with your YouTube channel, John. Congrats on a hundred thousand. I'd be like, oh my gosh, right. thanks so much. I love right. that, but maybe my situation is different from most. Um, if another individual, like maybe has a website out or they share their portfolio, and then the recruiter says, like, this is really good stuff. Uh, are you cool with me bringing this to my customer, my client, or the the company that I would like to showcase you to? I think that would that would be a feel good feel for me. Yeah, and, and the reason, I, and, and as I said, I'm not talking about doing anything illegal with, with gathering information on people, right? So um, I, I think that, and, and particularly when, if somebody's looking for a job, you should try to find commonality with the people that you are looking to network with within an organization. So if you, if you actually come across the manager for the group that you're trying to work in, you know, find commonality with that person, do a little research online, have they written white papers, have... Did they go to the same school as you? You know, um, I wouldn't go as far as to take it to a creepy level, right? Like, oh, I live a street away from you. You know, like, yeah. I wouldn't go there, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but at the same time, I think finding that commonality is a comfortable space. But at the same time, um, you know, you're seeing other countries, you know, that are um, pulling back from that and putting requirements in. You know, GDPR is a big one um, for companies how they collect that data and what they do with it and you have the rights to your data yeah. and so i think it's an interesting topic that will evolve some of the technology that we use potentially um, to find people in the next few years so that will be kind of interesting on our side to see what happens so particularly if that comes to the u.s there that, is, that is really interesting yeah so um another one of the things that we talk about is you know this is a really broad topic but um, there's a big focus in talent acquisition around, you can call it brand, um, talent, attach, talent attraction brand and EVP. So really what I'm saying is what 
of the information that a company puts out there is really important to you um, and or to anybody that you've talked to. So is a brand really important? Um, and, you know, what stands out for you? Yeah, okay. Um, obviously, I think it it does. Like, undoubtedly, my immediate answer to that, like, does brand matter? Like, yes, <laughs> yeah, straight up. Like, obviously, someone will be like, hey, I want to be the next... Google or Facebook or Fang, the, the whatever the giant companies, whatever that acronym is for the I don't know the cool hip places right. to work and be right. a part of these days. Um, yeah, that's real. Like that's super real. Maybe some people have a different opinion or they just don't agree with what that company is doing, and they're like, "No, hey man, GTFO, <laughs> I'm not I'm not into that." Uh, right. But if you look at my world, is is a lot of different defense contracting gigs. Uh, if you're a big fish in the pond, then you're attractive, right? Um, mm -hmm. Without naming specific companies, like there are obviously yeah. ones that'll be like, "Hey, you're a you're a well-known name," and that would be kind of cool if I were there and a part of that. Um, mm -hmm. On the other realm, and this might be different for different people, if they're more interested in a startup or a smaller company or something that's just kind of still growing or budding, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine that's doing some startup things and they wanted to chat and be like, Hey John, would you ever be interested in, in doing this thing? Uh, mm -hmm. I remember even just in my head, like, like my philosophy was like, Oh, I'll have this conversation with you because you're, you're a buddy, you're a friend, but I don't, I don't know what you would have to offer me because you're so tiny. And that's a, mm -hmm. a jerk thing to think, but I think it's real. Like that, right. that, that that's a conceptual thing. Um, you're an unknown, right? Yeah. yeah. But they're an unknown, right? Yeah, that and makes sense. There may be, I, I hear, uh, this is interesting, I, I think, in my mind, because obviously if you're a ginormous conglomerate, they could say, I know the phrase, there's such thing as you're, you're too big to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think on the other side of that, you can be so big, it's too big to not fail. Like it has to like, okay, this isn't going to be good because I'm just going to turn into a number. I'm just a cog in the machine. No one particularly cares about who I am. I'm just a, a, an entry in the right. database. It, it's all over the place. Maybe the, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not giving you a good answer because there is no, no I, good answer. I think it's, you know, it's partly personal preference, right? Yeah. Um, but what research would you do on an organization saying it's one that you had never heard of before? What would you do? Okay. To go out and research a company. Yeah, I absolutely do a Google search. I absolutely, I, I look at Wikipedia pages because that's always like the first thing that comes up and whether or not that's mm -hmm. accurate or not. But I like right. to look for news articles because if I can see like, hey, this company just did whatever X incredible thing, they're looking, their growth is going crazy. Who knows? Uh, that's very cool. Maybe again, if if that's a, a if that's a smaller company, maybe there aren't going to be yeah. so much common stuff about bigger ones. Um, I will also look at I, I don't know if it's Angel List or Glassdoor or whatever those things are. Glassdoor, that will tell you yeah. about like the quality of life there, like how the work right. actually is. Uh, are you cool with the management? Or is it I don't know? Do they provide the benefits that you would be actually expecting and were promised? Right. Um, stuff like promotion cycle. I don't even know. <laughs> Um, right. It's right. just cool to get other people's opinions because sometimes you don't always have that insight. Um, right. I think one of the greatest things, maybe this is a tangent, but I think one of the greatest things a talent recruiter or talent acquisition or recruiter could do is when they're having a conversation with a potential candidate, if they could say like, hey, I've got this person that's, I've got this employee that's actually in the same department or same group, or it's, it would be a coworker that you would be working with. Are you cool if I set up a conversation between you and them mm -hmm. just to get the real deal? I don't know if there's a risk in that from the, from the HR perspective, if someone, <laughs> if that person gives bad news, but it would be really, really cool just to be like, Hey, this is going to be the person that I'm really working with. And it's awesome to really get their opinion, like unfiltered, you know? No, I think that's a really good idea. And I think, that if more organizations did that, it would help their their hiring process because a manager is going to give you, um, you know, if you do an, an interview with a manager, they're only going to give you so much information around the position because they're in a management position. Um, you know, if you're able to talk to potential peers, I think that's hugely helpful to get a full round, you know, well-rounded view of what the group program organization is really like. Um, that's a big one. 
Um, okay, let's go with the one that's really kind of silly. So recruiters just starting in recruiting and cybersecurity. And all of the lovely um, images out there are of you all wearing hoodies and sitting in dark rooms and potentially, um, you know, growing mushrooms. So, <laughs> so um, I see that you're in a lit room, but is this a, a common thing? Do you all sit in hoodies in dark rooms? Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> There was, it's funny, there was like a thing on Twitter some time ago where all these whatever InfoSec or cyber people were being like, hashtag no hoodie. I don't even know what it was, but it was like a normal <laughs> yes. picture of just a right. person in their backyard. <laughs> right. <laughs> Here's sunlight. It, no, we're right. not. And maybe there is a stereotype that could be true to some extent in some crevice or enclave, um, but I, there's absolutely no, not all of us are... are are that <laughs> and the, some of them that are are incredible and super cool yeah. they're like the nicest people and the smartest people you could ever know <laughs> yes I, I know a few very well so yes i'm familiar with that awesome. awesome <laughs> oh goodness and so another one is that you know i think recruiters get really comfortable with a particular platform so as i've told you linkedin that's easy right i know not everybody wants to be on linkedin particularly getting all their end mails, right? Um, but let's talk about some of the other platforms that are out there. Um, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I know the answer to this, but where do you see, do you see that there's some generalizations of individuals in the cybersecurity world where they are, um, if they are online, or are they spread out? Yeah. You, you mean you've already said like, hey, I know the answer to this. Yeah, Twitter, I think, <laughs> I think is where a lot of the uh, InfoSec <laughs> folks go. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, how do you have a cybersecurity community on Instagram <laughs> or TikTok? I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, that one you shouldn't be on. But, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, hey, there are several that I follow on, on Instagram, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, definitely they're the ones that are, you know, more vocal. It's, it's helpful on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that, right? Cause you're getting into somebody's personal opinions, but Hey, that's what they're sharing there. Um, but definitely I think that's an interesting way to look so around. I totally yeah. thought you were going to ask me, like, how would you feel if someone like, asked you for like ask you about a job on Twitter I thought I thought you were gonna go in that direction I was like I don't know <laughs> is that something so, that would yeah. be done of course yeah yeah I mean you know I, I'm not gonna say every recruiter is gonna do that there mm -hmm. may be company policies that say no you cannot reach out to people on these platforms you know mm -hmm. so I can't speak for every policy but absolutely if, it, if the platform has a messaging capability you know and you can figure that some recruiter will probably reach out to you on there. Um, so, um, you know, I think there are a few out there that people can run a, remain anonymous on, right? Um, you know, the big ones are going to be whether it's Twitch or whether it's, it's um, you know, Reddit. But, um, you know, yeah, reaching out to you on those. So you're not sure how you feel about it? Uh, not yet, honestly. <laughs> I don't know. Part of me would feel like, hey, this is weird. Like, this isn't the right place. It's like asking like a, a, a strange and appropriate setting in like a real world event. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we have to think more on that one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry, people. John just wants emails. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So we want to talk about some horror stories that we have. Uh, oh, yeah that we have come across in the past the fun stuff <laughs> i know a lot of them on the recruiting side get posted online um mm -hmm. so yes i've read a lot of those but oh, did you see one of the the recent ones and i don't know if if this is something you've been keeping up with but that there was like a a kubernetes or a kubernetes um job posting that it was like required of 12 years of experience in Kubernetes and like the following picture yeah, right exactly. beside it is like this technology has been out for six years or half that or whatever the case yes. may have been. Yeah. 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 yeah you're, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That goes back to the job descriptions. Hey, it's, 
two people are more actually more than two people typically are responsible for that job description. So yeah, that that's not a good representation of my industry, but hey. <laughs> Um, you know, not just our responsibility, but I'll take it for, for this purpose. <laughs> so, yeah. And what else though? What else have you seen? Oh, okay. Oh, if we're looking at my, my, uh, side for horror stories, one of my pet peeves, or I guess I've seen, and it would be completely, would absolutely throw me off is getting like a LinkedIn mail or message or an email, uh, and the heading like the introductory message to the email is typically hi, John, or hello, or dear individual name. Uh, if it's an egregious, obvious copy and paste, and it's a good afternoon, Joshua. And <laughs> if it's like the wrong name, then I know like, oh, come on, man. You, you really just yes. lost a couple points for, with, with me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And there's different methods, you know, for recruiting. Some individuals like to do the higher volume, so they're going to use that method. Right. And some people, you know, are going to do individual messages. Um, there's no standard there. Um, and it works for some organizations in one way and, you know, the other, another organization. So, yeah, that can be a, a turnoff for sure. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of is that um, from, from my side, and have seen in the past is, um, so, you know, just kind of that ghosting aspect. Yeah. So, so something happens during the process, um, you know, you know, upfront, I have had individuals that have had a medical and emergency and they have gone off the grid. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's one of those places that I never write somebody off because I know that those things do happen. Right. Um, but aside from that, um, one of the things that I'm seeing a lot of is, you know, kind of that, okay, I'm behind the screen, therefore I don't have to respond. And you can respond to that by saying, hey, you know, your upfront message to me wasn't very engaging, respectful, X, Y, and Z, right? So it didn't fit me. So I don't need to respond. Um, you know, but I think when we're talking about somebody being into the process, you've been talking to them, and then they just disappear. And I think that's difficult. Um, you know, if you have developed a relationship with somebody or started to, um, I think it's easy to say, Hey, I'm no longer interested. We totally get it. And we really appreciate like when somebody says, okay, totally understand. Or we may ask you back, Hey, did you, you know, accept an offer or something like that? Um, but you know, because typically we have to close things out on our side and say why this right. stopped. Um, but at the same time, I think that's a big one and it happens a lot. I'm hoping, you know, that, um, changes over time. Maybe the messaging needs to be different from the recruiting side and we come to a better place in that, but a lot that happens a lot. Um, and, and I think there's multiple reasons for that. Right. So, um, maybe it's another offer that you've gotten. Um, you know, maybe it's, you're not getting what you need from the recruiter. There can be multiple reasons, but I think it's okay to just, send a short email or just let the person know, Hey, I'm no longer interested. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You can I mean, play devil's advocate. I, I, no, I, I agree with you. Um, in that like, Hey, I'm, I'm human and I'm fallible and I'm, and I'm victim to that too. Like I, I've certainly done that. Um, mm -hmm. if just that, Hey, my life got too busy and I didn't get back to your emails, but I, if anything, I could have just sent off a one liner, like, look, I'm really sorry. I kind of dropped the ball on this. Uh, I don't think I want to move forward. Um, and I mean, that's, that's all it takes. And I hate to do that just because it makes me feel like a, a jerk, but I know it's real. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, and, it, and in return, talent acquisition should be the same thing for you. Right? right. So if you're, you're, if you're no longer being considered, we need to make sure that we're letting you know that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that, you know, I, there's two sides of that for sure. Um, when that yes. is the case, uh, if there ever is a look, I'm really sorry. Uh, we're just going to be looking at other candidates. Uh, I, I think that is best done in a, in a personal message in an email. If it's an yes. automated thing, then it's just like a man, that's, that's a, that's a knife to your heart. Uh, yeah. if, especially if someone's really, really looking and they're, they're desperate is not the right word, but they're, they're eager and they really want something. You know, right. That kind of sucks. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, myself just going through, I've done talent acquisition for a long time. 
um, and just going through a more recent job change, even though I'm around it all the time, you do get desensitized to the feelings around that. And, and you know, let's, let's be honest, you're not thinking about it unless you're in that situation. And so, you know, I think talent acquisition needs to look at that honestly and realize that there are people on the other side of the screen um, and that's important. So, I mean, that brings up a really good point. Um, there was another piece to that um, that we kind of haven't talked about, but I wanted to cover because I've seen a lot of information online about um, when you apply, you know, kind of how you get sorted you know, potentially there's, there's 150 people that are qualified, right? So we're going to have this hypothetical situation, okay. which doesn't almost ever okay. happen. But, um, so, <laughs> so with that, um, when you apply to a company online on their website, you're going to go through typically either a CRM, um, or an Afghan tracking system. Um, one is based on engagement with you. One is based on really tracking you through the application process through to hire, um, and all those workflow statuses. Um, some organizations do have tools that will filter the individuals that come in, um, to the jobs. Um, so it will look for keywords in your resume. It will know, um, some of them are using. AI, so it's not really AI, but some of them are using tools to say, hey, we know that you have successfully hired these people in the past. This, These resumes look like this type of a person. You potentially want to hire these people or look at these people. So some organizations have those tools. Um, there's not a standard with that. Some companies just have literally an apply button. You fill out your information, and then you go into a bucket of people, um, no matter how big or small it is, and that's up to the individual on the other side inside the company to review all those people. Um, so there, there definitely is, I've seen a lot of kind of um, subreddits around that lately about, hey, every company has, you know, these, these filter where they filter everybody out. That's not the case. Um, a lot of times it's manual. Um, so it just depends on the company. But with that applying and using, going through to an applicant tracking system or a CRM, um, there, there's some things that I consistently see is one, when you're submitting a resume there, um, this is where you want to have that text-based resume. So the graphical resume is fantastic. It's gorgeous. I've seen several of them. I saw some last weekend with the uh, B-side San Antonio. Um, you know, but at the same time, the ATS is depending on who they use for um, parsing the data off your resume and putting those into those fields may or may not do that correctly if you have a graphical resume. Um, that doesn't mean don't use PDF, but if you have one with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of graphics in it, it, it can sometimes cause issues on the other end. And that then leads to a picture of who you are and you didn't even know it. So the resume that pops up for us every time somebody would search in, in an applicant tracking system is this resume that's all, you know, messed up you know, you don't want that. Um, so you guys would never know that unless you saw what it looks like, um, but it can really mess up the format on the other end. So make sure that when you're submitting through online and African tracking system, which you wouldn't know it's an ATS, but at the same time when you're submitting through online, making sure that that is a text-based resume. That is super good to know. Cause yeah. like even, even I, I tell people like, oh, in, everything should kind of be text, right? That's how you're going to make up your mm -hmm. resume. I don't, I don't think including a picture of yourself is necessary. I think that's kind of stupid, but I tell people, Hey, go ahead and put like the logo of your certifications on there. Um, but I mean, I know you're right. That's a good point. If they do whatever like OCR or stuff to scrape that out, well, that's just right. going to muff everything up. Uh, right. if, if, if it's just as simple as having a copy of your resume with the picture removed, then why not? Like that's easy to do. Yeah. I, I think what the challenge is a lot of the formats that you're seeing coming out of the different, um, word editors, um, document editors right now are a lot of these really cool tech looking resumes. Um, I know I had one previously as well, but I tested it to see what would happen and it was junk on the other end. Um, so just be aware of that. And a lot of times these systems will allow you, you're going to create a profile and it'll allow you to see what the person is seeing. If they, if they do obviously look at it, open that when it says there's a document that's enough, look at it. 
Um, I'm not saying don't use PDF. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying those images that you're talking about, like for the certs and stuff like that. Um, in that case, I would have those at the bottom of the resume, and it depends on the, the parsing tool that they're using, how that shows up in the format on the other side. So, cool. yeah. That's super good. I appreciate it. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions on your side? <laughs> yeah. How else can I help? What? Let's see. Um, you asked, you asked, uh, me a question. What's a big turnoff or, uh, is there any, and, and I kind of gave you some of the approach. Is there anything that you, I guess you, if I could turn that question over to you, what do you hate to see or what, what is really not going to work? Are there any egregious ones that you say, Oh, nope, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, I think about that. We're okay. talking like specifically resumes or, you know, yes, I, mean, I can, I can help okay. narrow that, I guess a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to just basics before you even look at the content that's on the resume. Um, okay, if there same, is same sort of thing on formatting. Yeah. Yeah. Same <laughs> formatting, spelling, multiple fonts. Um, gotcha. You know, I, I happen to be a visual person, so, you know, it doesn't mean I won't read it. I will. But at the same time, I may drag through it if it's, you know, more <laughs> difficult to read, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, those and and ones that are so long and don't need to be. Gotcha. Um, you okay. know, th there's some stuff you can cut off in your resume at a certain point. Um, you know, I worked at, you know, office depot and, you know, in high school, you know, there, there's certain details that you don't need on your resume, unless it's really relevant to show, look, I've been doing this forever. Like you, John, um, I don't that, know. that, I don't, you know, uh... I was, I, I, I wasn't recruiting in high school. So, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I see that on resumes frequently. Um, the, the one exception to that I would say is that, um, if you have held positions like student government, say you've done things that show um, maturity, um, interest in your field of study, um, maybe you were a Girl Scout all the way through um, high school, you know, those types of things that say commitment, maturity level, then those, those are pluses. If it's something that's, you know, I worked at a dry cleaner during a certain point and I'm looking for an information technology position, it doesn't need to be on a resume, right? But I still see that frequently. Um, and a lot of times I'm seeing where people are putting really important information that relates to the job at the very end of their resume. Um, I mean, you can see there's a, a ladders report out there around, um, you know, how long recruiters look at a resume. Um, supposedly we look at them for seven seconds. I look at them a little longer, but what, that's what, what is, they're what saying. What is that? If I, sorry, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> familiar was, with the ladders yes, report. If yeah, I so may. ladders, yeah, so there's there's a some testing done around how long um, individuals stay on jobs, um, how long, where specifically on the job does their eye go? So that I found really fascinating. So talking about kind of left aligned information was really important. Um, and then it reported in there, I believe that recruiters stay looking at a resume, they, they gauge whether they want to continue looking at a resume for um, around seven seconds. So potentially they can move on from there. Now, um, don't quote me, the article came out a little while ago, but at the same time, um, you know, that may or may not be true for every single recruiter, but at the same time, it tells you how quickly, just like you are when you're making a judgment whether to respond to somebody or not, the recruiter is doing the same thing. So you want to give them that information up front. So I think that's the most important takeaway on that one. Um, yeah, I think that's hugely helpful. Um, you know, the other thing I was going to say is, um, you know, I find that a lot of individuals, um, when it comes to, you know, recruiters, as I said, are not career counselors. So one, um, there are places you can look, there is, you know, real support you can purchase from other individuals that will give you career guidance. You can reach out to people in communities. Um, when it comes to salary information, um, you know, there's an article on, um, I think it's Money Under 30, 
that talks about um, seven different places to look at salary information. Um, so do your research. Um, the other piece is that I find a lot of times that um, we call you guys candidates, sorry, um, I know you're people, but on a, I'm making a generalization of candidates, um, that um, they'll come to us and ask us, what, what should I look for? What should I do in a career? What should I do in a job? You know, that's not where we specialize. Um, and so I find that you really need to, as an individual looking for a job, do a self-assessment, you know, first of all, do a pro, you know, an audit online, seeing what is out there, but around you, but do a self-assessment, look at what your strengths and weaknesses are, where you want to go, what do you want to have a job? What do you want to have an organization? Um, you know, do a lot of research around the types of positions you want, the types of organizations, and then the people that work there and, network with the the people that work there um you know that doesn't mean immediately reach out to every person in a company develop a relationship find commonality with them so developing that plan is, is big um and is would be hugely helpful so i would love to give people advice on what they should do in their careers but i can't tell every one of you where you should work or what type of job you should take um that's not my specialty dang because yeah. i was i was just about to kind of Ask if you could <laughs> give me you, give me a good capture of what what advice would you give to someone wanting to break <laughs> into the industry? That's always a good closer. But if if, if there's no one size fits it's, all answer, I understand. <laughs> no, I, I think they need to look at they need to look at themselves. What are your strengths? You know, um, you know, particularly if you're trying to even if you're you're making a, a mid career switch. Um, do the research, find the jobs that have the require the skills and capabilities that you have. Um, if there are weaknesses that you can correct, great. Work on correcting those. If they're not, then realize I shouldn't go after those jobs. Um, that's, that's a big one that I find that people get their eyes set on something early on because they maybe touched it in school and then they go, this is my career path. And then somewhere along the way, they realize maybe this isn't the best fit for me. And they don't do, they don't course correct, you know, um, and we find that in recruiting that's everywhere. Right. Um, but no, if, if you're trying to get into the field, you need to do research. What did I say to you the other day about, um, you know, do your research like a contester and, and manage your career like a CISO? I don't yes. know. It was very clever at the time. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it was that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I think that's the biggest takeaway is, is you have to be very smart about, this and there's not one way there's not one skill there's not one cert there's not one degree to get into it it's the entire spectrum of what you do that will get you into the next job cool i want to i want to zoom in on that on that line do your research like a pen tester and manage your career like a CISO. that, that should be the i'll take that away. quote yeah absolutely i love it cool cool well, well, i think this was really helpful for me I yeah. hope it's helpful for um, you guys as well. Oh, I hope so. I and I and I really, really think so. Honestly, I, even me just hanging out and listening, there's definitely a lot that I I can take away from this. So I think it's awesome. And thank you for I don't know being Absolutely. willing to just thank have you. this conversation. I I, I think this has been really, really great. And I hope it helps both sides because I know that's, that yeah. that was the goal oh, here was you. both communities. Hey, well, let's let's kind of break down those walls. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a good time to do it. Those virtual walls, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Cool. All right. Then I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank All you. Right, thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't say it enough. Um, I, I am grateful because what we've done with the hey the, ch the cheesy YouTube channel, right? When I get to put this out online, we broke about 100,000 subscribers, which is a milestone for me. That's and huge. I'm super duper grateful for it. But I hope you know. And hey, you've got that. You've got that takeaway. Yeah. Your, your voice is yeah, going to a lot of good you. people. So I hope. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely.